Welcome tonight. I'm just glad you're here. Spirit of God is ministering to somebody watching through film or video, whatever we call it. I'm kind of a little drunk in the spirit. You know, I sing. I imagine God just interchanging with us and really, really ministering to our hearts. Remember, he went through a lot to get us to be saved. Didn't he? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Does anybody here know what that word perish means? It simply means, huh? Come to an untimely death or to be destroyed before your time. Hello? Now that brings up a question. Why are certain people die early? Why certain people don't? Well, we're going to answer some of that tonight. Welcome, ladies, welcome. We have some outlines for you. As always the sheets, we kind of keep them over there. And, you know, if you want to see Joe run around, just go ahead. <laughs> Amen. It's good to see you, Jackie. It's good to see you, Sherry. And those of you coming in by camera, it's just wonderful that they're doing that. I don't know about you, but it is very hard for me to see myself on camera. Kind of like the first time somebody gave you a tape recorder and you taped something and played it back to yourself, right? First time when you, sp when you speak, you hear yourself in your inner ear. But when you hear others speak, you hear them with your outer ear. So when you put your voice on tape, you do it with your inner ear, but when you play it back, you hear yourself with your outer ear. And the same thing works with your eyes. It's kind of funny because we become instant critics whenever there's a camera on us. In fact, when we used to teach our Bible college people back in the day of uh, Joy of the Lord Fellowship years ago, we would teach and train preachers and ministers, and the first thing we'd do after two or three weeks was we'd put a camera on them, and their job was to bring a sermon. And then nobody judged them. They were to take that video home and judge themselves and sit and come back and the class would discuss what we can do to improve. Boy, I tell you what, that kind of reduced the numbers a little bit. Anyway, the comforter has come. Amen. This is our second week of this series. Now, what we hope to do in this series is to teach you how to grow close to the Holy Spirit. The Bible likens the Holy Spirit unto a dove. Do you know why the Holy Spirit is like a dove? Because he's to be treated with respect. Doves, in fact, we have doves come in the morning. And the one thing a dove will do, you watch them, they'll bob their head, and they're watching you. Every time they bob their head, they're going click, 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 click with their eyes, watching what's going on. them. And as soon as they see something dark, they're gone. So how do we relate that to the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit will never leave you nor forsake you, but the Holy Spirit can be quenched, it can be grieved, and it can be resisted. Hello. Now, I'm not talking about you, I'm just, we're teaching and we're training. So if the Holy Spirit is giving you your healing, if the Holy Spirit is giving you understanding of the word, you still with me? Then we don't want to grieve the one that's giving it to us, do we? If the Holy Spirit's handing you healing, you don't want to slap his hand. You want to work with him to receive your healing. Now, let me ask you something before we get started. When Jesus healed people, were they healed instantly all the time? Tell me about it. Well, first of all, that's not what we're dealing here. We're dealing with, sometimes when Jesus prayed for him, he had to do it again. Remember the man where he spit, made the spittle and anointed his eyes? And he says, and he says, what do you see? And he says, I see men as trees. Then he did it again. I'm teaching somebody here by the spirit of God, okay? Sometimes if it doesn't happen instantly, the enemy just comes right away and says, see, you didn't get it. You need to learn how to hold on what is rightfully you, yours as a Christian believer. Remember, everybody that Je now listen, everybody that Jesus healed in the New Testament and the Old Testament were they saved or sinners? 
there wasn't any righteous. So if the devil lays, oh, you're not holy enough. You're not good enough. You see what a lie that is? Jesus didn't ask people before he prayed for them, are you holy enough? You see, so we got weird concepts. So again, this teaching, the comforters come, is going to teach us how to work with the Holy Spirit. So open your Bibles to John 14. That's where we broke off last week. Jesus promised another comforter. How many here have got a comforter at home? Isn't it great? Cold winter, wrap up in that comforter. Some of you have got custom comforters. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You know, you can, yours maybe with the special initials on it, you know. It's just so soft. It, it meets your needs, right? What I'm saying by this is the Holy Spirit wants to be personal with you. So I don't want you to treat him generally as something is just there because he's God. See, the Holy Spirit's God. He has a body, but he functions like water, like mist in the air. He manifests Christ. He points us to Jesus. He helps guide us in the truth. He does all those things. I shouldn't grieve him. Okay, so we're going to teach you how to work with him. All right, so John 14, look at verse 15 through 18, please. Now, is this Old Testament or new? I'm not trying to give you a trick question, but listen. Did Jesus die and rise again yet? So listen, and this is not a trick question, but you need to understand that. So everything he's ministering up until the time he dies and rises again is still under the Old Testament, even though it's in the new book. Hello. Because the New Testament is called a covenant, and it doesn't come into operation until Jesus rises from the dead. Hello. So in John 14, had Jesus died yet? Has he rose from the dead yet? So it's very important we listen to how he talks. Another thing about John, this is the book I always tell young Christians to read and get to know Jesus. Why, Pastor Kerry? Well, number one, the Jesus that's written about in John is written about in love. It's written in a love fashion. And God is. So if you read Jesus in Luke, you're going to get more of the humanity part. If you read G about Jesus in Matthew, you're going to get more of the factual parts. If you read about Jesus in, in, in Luke, um, no, in, excuse me, Mark, you're going to get the servant part. But when you read about Jesus in John, John talks about the loving, the, the caring, the part that says, Philip, he that hath seen me, has seen the Father? The part where Jesus scoops his disciples up in his bosom and teaches them what he's going to teach right now. So John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my what? All right, guys. What are the commandments of Christ? This is a test. If you love me, you're right on the money. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's the two commandments, he says, to love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as, as yourself. In this, all fulfill the law. So when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my love commandments. Walk in love. What chapters is it? This is in John. John teaches about the love of Jesus. So if you love me, we do, keep the love commandments. And I will pray, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter or another what? Helper. Everyone say, I need help. Okay. If the helper is going to come alongside and help you, don't sock him in the teeth by him being rude. 
I'm just going to kind of make these things. Oh, no, you never, we would never do that. But anyway, let's, let's kind of look at this, all right? So it says, another helper, helper, that he may abide with you how long? Forever. So, listen, the devil maybe want to tell you, you grieve God and the Holy Spirit's left you. I know there's people watching, maybe you've heard something like that. That's not so. The Holy Spirit says, I'll be with you for what? Forever. Jesus says, I'll be with you for? Forever. I will never leave you nor? So the idea is there's still a liar in the earth lying about God, still laying weird religious trips on people. So let's go over what he said again. He says, if you love me, show me that you love me by loving me and keep loving others. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you a helper, that he might by, be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Why can't the world receive from the spirit of God? Because of flesh. The spirit resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And what you said, too. They don't have eyes to see. So it goes on, it says, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him, the word see there means perceives, understands him, nor knows him. But you, he's talking to his disciples, but you know him, for he, ha he dwells with you. And then look, and he will be, everyone say, in me. In me. Why was it the Holy Spirit in him? Still Old Testament. Jesus hadn't died and rose again. Remember last week, the people of the Old Testament had a very limited covenant with God. God worked limited. Why? Because this planet was given by Adam and Eve over to Satan. And that's why we find huge, huge deluges and ice ages coming through this earth. Why? Because of the corruption. Noah's flood. Get a chance, read about it. Genesis 6 through 8 talks about how bad it was during that time. So in the Old Testament, there was really, they couldn't just call on God. God had to battle for them. So it was pretty tough. So when Jesus showed up, he's teaching them a new walk. Let me give you an example. When Jesus came into the temple in his own hometown and read for the prophet Isaiah, and everybody goes, ah, this is Joseph's son. What'd they want to do with him? Kill him. Could they touch him? No. How many times did that happen to Jesus? A lot. Let me ask you something. You and I have a walk in Jesus much the same way. The more you living for yourself, the rougher your life will be because the enemy can trick us. But the more we live for God, God will give you lots of things to enjoy, but he won't let the devil in to steal from you. That's the key. You say, well, how come the enemy still gets a whack in once in a while? Because you'll find out when he does, you're not on God. You're not focused. You're thinking either about what happened or you're blue and stuff. And we sometimes, not always, open the door and we put up a sign and say, come and get me. Now, we don't mean to. It's not going to be by one slip. It's going to through a continual use. How many know that somebody who speaks negative all the time wears a big old flag saying, come and get me? <clears throat> then if you think about it, not only does the enemy like to search those people out, but it seems like every negative thing in the world happens to them. And I think that can't, I think that's a setup. Okay, so let's go on. John 14, now it goes on. Even the spirit whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't understand him, it doesn't know him, but you know him, he dwells with you, I'm that, and will be in you. 
And it, I will not leave you what? Now, do you understand what it means to be an orphan? Probably not. Having no father, and then suddenly somebody says, Carrie, you know, Sherry's family or whatever says, Carrie, we want to adopt you. I'm 66 years old. <laughs> do you understand? We become adopted. That's what God does. It doesn't matter what age. We come to know the Lord. God wonderfully and marvelously adopts you. And he doesn't care where your past is. He doesn't remind you of your failures. He puts a fat, he kills a fat cap, puts a ring on your finger, puts a robe around you, hugs your neck, and says, welcome to the family. So I will not leave you orphans. So you got to realize the disciples are sitting there. Where are you going, Jesus? You can't leave now. Things are good. Yeah, they didn't understand. Jesus says, look, I got to go. I'm not going to leave you orphans. So let's go through the four points underneath that one. Number one, the, world, the word for helper is paraclete. You know, not cleats like football players, but paraclete. Para means to come along the side. A cleat means one who can coach, teach, and train, who will abide with you forever. How many here could use a little coaching? How about a little teaching? How many here just recently, somebody shared something with you and it taught you something, and you thought, well, that's pretty cool. Teaching's good, you know? All right, and not only that, but coaching and teaching, what else does he do? Trains. Folks, when I taught my children how to brush their teeth, I didn't tell them go into the bathroom, get the toothbrush and start brushing. I showed them. And what I want to do here is, in this ministry, is show you how to lay hands on the sick. Show you how to walk with the Holy Spirit. So it's not such a mystery. Can you say amen? Jesus' disciples were with Jesus 24-7. Jesus didn't become a mystery after a while. They saw how he ate, how he talked, how he treated people. And he says, look, I'm leaving. Ah! I will not leave you orphans. Okay, point two. In the Old Testament, the Spirit came on them for God's use, but then left like a piece of cloth that pulled away from the clothing. Point three, remember, Jesus did not die and rise yet, so the Holy Spirit could not indwell their spirit, okay, in a permanent way. He could only work as in the assignments that God gave to each of the Old Testament believer and the prophets. And fourthly, Jesus restated what he would do. He would not leave them orphans, nor forsake them. Can you say amen? And I, I've heard people say, oh, God's left me. Wait a minute. That's not what the, the word says. Please line up what you believe with the word. And if you're not sure, don't blurt out something that the devil can hear. I mean, he's not always listening to you, but it could be that you with the bullhorn could be shouting on the rooftop something negative, and you could catch wind of it. Say amen, not say oh me. All right, my next point, the promise of a teacher and a trainer. How many here would like to say, Holy Spirit, teach and train me? You can every day. When you meet with God, say, God, Lord, I want, I just, here's what I, I one of the things I do. I say, Father, I want to tell you I love you. Jesus, I want to tell you I love you. Holy Spirit, I just want to tell you, you're just an excellent teacher. And all of you, God, I want to just magnify your name. Now, see, the Father is God. Jesus is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. Now, some people teach that the Holy Spirit, because they use the term spirit, he floats around like a, a mist. That's one of his attributes. But he also comes down like water. He also rises up like fire. These are his attributes, but he has a body like you and I have. Didn't God say to the Father, didn't the Father say to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image? 
huh? After our likeness. So look, take a look at yourself. Look across the table at your friends. Guess what? We're the only creature that is made in God's image. Angels were not. Now, that doesn't mean that we're God's favorite and he hates everything else. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that God was finished with his creation of us. He would finally make a creature that could fellowship with him on his level. Not that we make planets and people. Can you say amen? But we could talk with God on his level. Remember, God came and visited with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. All right, so the Holy Spirit's job is to bring us back to that kind of fellowship. His job is to bring Peggy so close to God when she opens her, her eyes in the morning, that's who she sees. Whether her eyes are really open or not, she cannot tell, but there's God. The Holy Spirit's job is to take us and train us the principles of the kingdom in such a way they become very useful. You see, I had to relearn how to walk with this fake leg, this prosthetic. And I'm so thankful God didn't leave me, nor he forsook me. He had to teach me how I could bring my life to balance so I could balance my walk with the prosthetic. Now, how many know that you and I get out of balance periodically? So one of the ideas that we need to understand and also make the Holy Spirit feel welcome, his job is to bring us back into balance. If you're over, let's say you're doing a good thing, but you're overdoing it. Just done a good thing. Maybe you didn't want make four biscuits, you made 104 biscuits. God brings that balance so you don't overdo it, okay? He also trains us and teaches us how to not waste motion. Do you know what? There's a difference between working hard and working smart. Hello? Are you guys with me tonight? The Holy, the Holy Spirit's job is to do that with us, to help us to be graceful. Can you say, look over to your neighbor and say, hi, Grace. You look real graceful. Have you fallen today? No, just, I'm, I'm just joking. You know, the doctors tell you. Anyway, could you laugh with me a little bit? So the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us, keep us focused on Christ, to keep us trained, and so we understand the principles of the kingdom. Say amen, somebody. Amen. All right, so the promise of the teacher and the trainer, John 14, look at verse 26. But the helper, or the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will, listen, send in my name. Remember, everything in the New Testament is sent through the name of Jesus. Whatever you do in word and do, do all in the name of the Lord. Okay, in Acts, what does it say? There is no other name given among men whereby in which we be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. And it says, what is it, in Ephesians, I think? It says, no other name in heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. And things in heaven, things under the earth, things on earth must bow its knee to Jesus. Now, here's the thing. The name of Jesus is so powerful, don't try to change it. You hear these people, I don't know what they're doing. They're preaching in the name of Adonai and Yahweh. And they're trying to be fancy and use one of these old biblical names for God. Listen, God didn't say do it in the name of Yahweh. He said, do it in the name of Jesus. Hello. That's just a deception. Wouldn't it be wonderful if after a period of time, the devil could say, hey, let's move Kerry off of what he's doing and let's get him into some pomp and circumstances and let him get away from all of that heavy preaching and let's just get him into romanticizing about God. Let's get him to wave a few flags and do a few chants and have a few feasts. And uh, uh, we'll preach in the name of Yahweh and all the other. See, you see what, how that could be such a slow deception. Now, I love the Jewish people, but if you're a Gentile and not a Jew, 
Don't try to be a Jew. Love the fact you're a Gentile. I'm Scottish. I'm a born again Scot Scottish man, but it's an American. My family came over years ago over to America to start a new life. So I'm Scottish in background, but I'm a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, scripture-quoting, devil-chasing, overcoming child of God. Amen. And so are you. You have all that bit of equipment. But the Holy Spirit's job now is not to leave us alone. His job is to take us and ever so properly train us in the things that are spiritually been mysteries and reveal them to us and train us how to use them. Someone say amen. amen. So the helper of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Everyone say all things. All Here's a mystery for you. Does he mean everything? No. Who would like to look up a couple of scriptures for me? Second Corinthians 517. I need somebody to look that one up. I need you to read it and I'll record it after you. Some will look up Romans um, 828. And one more. First Peter uh, chap oh excuse me, Second Peter chapter one verse two. Okay? Second Corinthians 517, first one. Romans 828, second one. And first Excuse me, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Okay, who wants to be the first one? Okay, real loud. Romans 8, 28. Ro we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Perfect. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And I think I left a part of that out. Now let's look at that. Okay, everybody. All things work together for good. Is he talking about everything? Now, I want you to think about it before you jump out there and answer this, okay? Is the plane crash that killed your mom and dad working together for your good? Pay attention to me. No. God can get good out of a tragedy, can he? But God didn't make the plane crash to teach you something. So when we read a scripture, we can't take it loosely. We need to apply it in its historical setting and its context. And the term there, all things work together for good to them that love God, means that if God is love and every good and perfect gift is from the Father of lights, everything he sent you is good. So let me, let me show you exactly what he's saying there. He's saying... How shall he not freely give you all things with Jesus Christ? He says, these all things that are working together for your good are the all things that you find over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Who has that one? Who looked that one up? Yeah, no, yeah. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Keep going. Keep reading. Yeah. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living and godly life. Okay, everything that you need. So the old King James, or the new King James says, that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Thank you, BJ. And we know that all things work together for good. Now, who's got 2 Corinthians 5 17? Okay. You ready for this? Preach it, sis. It says, God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sin. You, you are not in the right scripture. It's no, you're second. You're just about the message. Or the message. Okay. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, sis. God is Very good, and that's correct. But it says, 
If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. All things passed away. All things become new. Everyone say, all things passed away. All things become new. So, if all things work together for good, is it the all things that passed away? Or is it all things that are good? What did God put in you? <clears throat> all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay. Though our outward man perish, our inward man's being renewed. So, catch me. This is not a test. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But while you're experiencing life outwardly, God is working inwardly for your good. Hello. And though you receive outer pressures, the Holy Spirit is teaching you and training you that all things that pertain to life and godliness inside of you are working together for your good. So if somebody in your life dies from an airplane crash, God will still work good, not out of the airplane crash, but in you analyzing and being able to understand it. So the pressures of outside life are meant to destroy you while God living on the inside of you is meant to put you over. Can you say amen? So all things there, you know, Scripture says, will teach you all things. What all things will he teach you? The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. What things will he teach you? All things good. Not all things. He's not going to teach you about your dirty laundry. He's not going to teach you about the church up the street, what your husband's doing behind your back. No, I'm just joking on that one. Hello, or wife. He's not going to teach you those things. He's going to teach you only what's good and what's Christ-centered. And see, that's why you don't know the Holy Spirit like you should. Because God does not glorify anything else but what he's doing. He doesn't want you paying attention to what the enemy's doing. Even though I, as a pastor, I have to teach you about the enemy and about these crazy things, I want you always focused on Jesus and always palling up with Jesus because we need the wisdom that's from above. Can you say amen? So this scripture says this again. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. He's going to give you nightmares of that plane crash. No. No, pay attention to what the scripture says. Remember, it's all things that I said to you. Now look at 1626. John, excuse me, 1526. They should be in your notes too, if not. But when the helper comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father. Here the Father will send in the name of Jesus, and here Jesus will send from the Father the Spirit of what? Okay, so can the Holy Spirit lie? Can the Holy Spirit point out your faults? Hello? No, he's going to tell you the truth. Here's how it works. How many ever had a conviction? Do you know what a conviction is? I'm not talking about being arrested. <laughs> okay, when, when, when God is dealing with us, he gives us what's called a conviction. Inside our heart, he doesn't condemn us, but we know inside our heart that's not right. We need to stop. How many ever, come on, wave at me. You've all had something like that. Okay, so your conviction is the Holy Spirit showing you and giving you a check about not proceeding in that area because it's going to be harmful. Hello. So when God talks to you about your life, when he puts his finger on your life about something, it's time for it to go. He'll never give you condemnation, but he'll give you conviction. And here's how it works. He'll, he'll lead you to the word, and the word, it says, the entrance of God's word gives us light. So the light shines into an area of our life that we're not dealing with. 
In fact, everybody else can see that we need to deal with it, but we're ignoring it. We've the prince of denial. And yet the Spirit of God through the Word is not condemning us. He's putting his finger on us. says, you need to work on that. You need to work on that. Okay, that's good. Can you say amen? But he never gives, he never gives condemnation. So the Word comes in, reveals it, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit leads you out of bondage. But you've got to obey what the Spirit tells you. So there the Scripture says, and he will guide you into all truth, and he will testify of me. Hello. Right? Okay, a couple of points underneath that. Point one, two, and three under John 15, 26. The Holy Spirit's job is to what? Is to teach us all things and point to the teachings of of Christ. Now what all things is he teaching us? All things that are good. All things of the word. Amen. I used to have people say, you know God, the spirit of God is showing me that so and so has got this real problem. I look at them and say, the spirit of God's not showing you that. He doesn't work that way. That's God's son or God's daughter. And the Holy Spirit always protects each child of God. So guess what? These people running around revealing your secrets, that's a familiar spirit. That's an evil spirit doing that because it causes trouble. It doesn't cause good. God's showing me, sister. There's a see. I mean, evangelists used to do this all the time. They get up there and they preach a really emotional meeting, which are great. But then if you're not careful, they'll play this one on you. You know what it is, what God's been dealing with you about. And you know you've got to get it under the blood. Get up here right now. You know that problem? Everybody's got a problem. And if you hammer it long enough, there's going to be always those sweet little ones. It must be me. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit so convicts you, you can't sleep. You got to get on your face or however you can and say, God, I've got to meet with you. We've got to get this under the blood. But he doesn't give you condemnation. He, he gives you freedom. Can you say amen? Okay, you with me? Third thing, remember, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He is a person, not a mist, not a floating cloud. His job is, to, is very clear, yet he manifests in many different ways. He came down as a dove. Why? Think about Noah. What was the first... And, you know, he let out a what? A bird. Was it a crow first and then a dove? Raven first. And then that didn't work. <laughs> so he sent out a dove, right? First one didn't come back, second one did. But it's amazing how God uses these types and shadows. He says in one time, go to the birds. Check them out. Neither one of them are worried about anything. In fact... It'd be fun for you to sit on my deck and watch all the birds dismantle my owls. All right, let's go on. <clears throat> Ducks come flying in, grabbing stuff. We had a falcon come in and hunt rats. You know, they come up from the bushes and everything. As soon as one pop its head up, here comes this falcon out of nowhere. Linda and I had prayed, God, do something about them because I don't like poison. Putting out poison kills other things, you know. Anyway, let's move on. You thought I missed the whole thing, didn't you? All right, so now, let's go on further. Now, Holy Spirit's job is to magnify Christ. Everyone say magnify. Amen. Do you guys know what magnify means? When you have a magnifying glass, what does it do? It makes it bigger, it makes it bigger so you can understand or see it, right? When you magnify a guitar, what do you do? You amplify it. You make it louder. Or change its tones. Can you say amen? So the Holy Spirit's job is to get you, and 
and to magnify who? Christ. So his job is to make Christ 3D for you, to understand him. Instead of Jesus saying to Philip, Philip, you've seen me, seen the Father, Holy Spirit saying, here, let me show you Jesus looks just like the Father, and let me show you how you can be like him. How many know that we all have a race to run? I, uh, I didn't know I had a race to run. You all have a race to run, and, and don't look so sad. The, the race that you have to run is your life. You're competing against something. You're competing against your flesh. Look at me for a minute. Your flesh says you're never going to be anything. Just take what you got. And your spirit with God in it is saying, run the race. Yeah, it's an adventure. So we can either choose to go one way or choose the other. Now, here, here's the thing. Every day you have that choice. Who are you going to follow? Well, today I'm fleshing out. No, you know what I mean. You're going to follow. Right. The race you have to run, you're not in competition with anybody else but yourself. Your job is to become better. Look at the person next to you. Look across the way and say, hey, have you ever done something so well? How about so-so? How about so-so? And would you like to do it better? Would you like to do it better? How many ever like to do something better? To learn how to do it. You cook your favorite meal and you like to learn how to do it better. That's the Holy Spirit, Spirit's job. Your walk is not perfect. He wants to help make it better. Hello? If you got people on your case saying, hey, you need to get it together, go to God and have the Holy Spirit change you and help you do it better. I have this old phrase I, I use. I don't know where I heard it from. But how many here know God accepts us for just the way we are? Just accepts us the way we are, totally. Isn't that marvelous? And it is. He's not looking for us to jump through hoops or anything. He accepts us for just the way. But how many know he's smarter when he doesn't leave us that way? How many know he wants us to be with him to be better? You're a fallen creature. You have a fallen piece of skin around your bones. That fallen piece of skin gets sick, gets viruses. It, it's nasty. You need to expose it to the light as much as possible. Christ is the light. And in, in our case, in my case, I was a sickly type of person. And I found out that the more I got closer to Jesus, the healthier I got. Who's our health? God is. So if you're staying away from God and kind of just treat him as a religious person, you're never going to get all the deep benefits that he promises. Psalms 103, 1 through 3 says... Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless the Lord, and forget not all his benefits. Who healeth all your iniqu uh, who forgiveth all your iniquities, and healeth all your diseases. So, if he does, and yet we still need some more healing, don't stop. Don't sit down and go, oh, come, why me, why me, why me? Because the moment you do that, Satan's going to give you a list. All right, moving right off of that. So our teacher teaches us about the areas. He teaches us how to talk right. How many know we could use a better way of talking at times? Hello? He can teach us how to see the way he sees. Right? He can teach us not to judge. People judge so much, they put themselves in bondage before noon. <laughs> well, that guy, he'll never amount to anything. Wait a minute, you just judged somebody. How about one thing? Can I, can I tattle on myself? 
God is really working with me about name calling. Calling somebody stupid. Now, I know it sounds really brash, me saying that, but periodically things slip. Now, I don't run around calling people stupid, and I don't do that. But every once in a while, you get all worked up, and you see some of this junk people are doing, and something might just kind of, and so God has been working, but he says, did you know, son, when you name call, you judge. You're making a judgment. Well, that's dumb. And you say, you want to be careful of that. And you say, well, Pastor Kerry, come on. No, I ask God, teach me how to be like a, a man of God that my words don't fall to the ground. That it fulfill in the listener the things that God wants them to know. Lynn and I always pray that, that we teach you with the great things of God, not from ourselves, not the, not the teachings of men. And I want to be able to pass out what the Lord's given me without me, you know, being two-faced. Can you say amen? I don't want to be a whited sepulcher full of dead man's bones. Hello? I don't want to look good on the outside, be rotting on the inside. Moving right along. Are you with me? So, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. This is John 16, verse 17 through 14. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict. See the word? That's why I taught you about convict. He's not slamming them. He's saying, hey, you guys are lost. Open your eyes. What's this new statement? The woke You'll hear, hear people drop phrasing things called, they're woke, part of the woke group. No, they're not. They're, they're part of the dumb group. There I go calling a name again. Nobody woke. They're all half asleep. I don't know what it means, but it, it's those people that woke up and realized there's more to life than just being a religious person. They woke. I'll tell you what, they're deceived. Whatever that is. I, I thought, what is that? Just kind of made me feel slimy. I'm sure they meant it kind of good, but you know, the world always are messing things up. You want, you want to ruin something? Just put it in man's hands without God's guidance. And they're sure to mess it up. All right, let's go on. Look, and he said, he will come, convict the world of sin. Is that with an S or singular? Okay, so what do we know about sin singular? It's the nature of sin. So he'll convict the world for not being saved of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Verse 9, of sin, because they do not believe on Jesus. That's the only way we can be saved. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you'll see me no more. The only way you can be right is through Jesus Christ. Now look at the next phrase. And of judgment, because the ruler or prince of this world is judged. Who's the ruler or the prince of this world? Satan. Satan. Know this. Satan's already sentenced. He's already judged. There's written on him the, the inscription, you are going to hell. You have but a short time. Everyone say the devil's going to hell. God's going to see to it. But he has but a short time. What's he doing? He's trying to take as many uh, people that are ignorant and don't know better with him as he can. Trying to sell them on an alternative. So God says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm not going to let you be exposed to this. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. His job is don't grieve him. The hook up with him, he's going to teach you all about the kingdom and show you your walk and get you out of here. Now, don't grieve him. Don't quench him. You better learn what he has to show you. And he, judgment, because the prince of this world is judged already. Can you say amen? So the people that agree with the devil, they get his judgment. 
And the people that agree with Jesus, they get his forgiveness. So which day to which will you follow? Get up every day and ask God to help you follow him because he is the life, the truth, and the way, the way, truth, and the life. Okay, so he goes on and listen. And he says in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. You will after I rise from the dead. However, when the spirit of truth is come, he will what? He will guide you into all truth. How much? So here's what you do. You say, Father, I need to know why I'm not receiving my healing like I should. So instead of doubting, you go to the Word and find some healing scriptures. Then you go to the Lord and you say, God, begin to show me. And God will show you via the Holy Spirit, and he will take you into that truth, and you will find yourself to be healed. But you got to go with him. What do you mean? You, got, you can't be thinking, how about the issue of blood? Remember the woman with the issue of blood? Do you know anything about that story? Well, she had heard, just heard about Jesus. She was a Jewish woman. She had suffered many things. She had an issue of blood. In other words, her menstrual cycle wouldn't stop. You know, she's bleeding to death. And Jewish people, because they can't help the sick, would throw you off in the corner and say unclean, and you were not to come anywhere near anybody. Why are you going to get any help? This woman was determined she was going to go to where Jesus was. And she crawled through the crowd, and she kept saying, the scripture says in the Greek, she kept saying all the time, I'm just going to touch him, just got to touch him, just got to touch him, just got to touch him. I just got to touch him. I just, I, when I touch him, I just, all the time she's crawling through that crowd. When she reached up to touch him, faith con connected. What I'm saying to you is, you need to let the Holy Spirit teach you how to humble yourself. Put everything aside and touch the hem of his garment. Only the Holy Spirit can teach you personally what works for you. The word works for you, but how to get you to open up. Remember, he's your grace grease. It teaches you about how you open up to God. Generally, we all are to open to God, but we have specifics with each one of us that minister to us specifically. Little quirks and stuff that the Holy Spirit's got to help us with. That's why we can't, I can preach a general message on divine healing and I can get about half the people healed. But the rest, the Holy Spirit's got to take them and to the garment where they've got to press on to where they make contact with Christ. Nothing else matters. And the only place that I can explain that to you is have you do it. I've experienced some of that, but hey, I haven't experienced everything. Press on. Don't stop. You tasted that the Lord's good? Press on. Ask lots of questions. Fall in love with God. He's not going to harm you. He's going to unite your family, not divide it. He's going to unite your life and not, not tear it up. But you've got to trust him and relax. It's kind of like the doctors, you're in the, you're in the dentist office, and the guy's coming at you with a big needle, and he says, now just relax. <laughs> no, that's how we think about God. He's not coming at us with a big needle. He's coming at us with some sedation, because <laughs> we need to be sedated. Some of us are big yahoos, you know. Let's go on. All right, Jesus promised of another comforter. Let's go on. Let's get press on through that. We got to turn my page. A couple of points. Number one, why is it better for Jesus to go away? He's looking at his disciples. It's needful that I go away. Why? Well, 
He's going to send another comforter. That's right. But when Jesus rose again from the dead, what did he set in motion? The New Testament. The Holy Spirit. The kingdom. The name. The blood. The new covenant. And the Holy Spirit. Right? So if he didn't go, they would have one person, Jesus, which was good. But now that the Holy Spirit's come, he's everywhere all at once. Moving right along, too. His job is to set in order the plans and the purpose of a God in mankind and our personal life. Three, the Holy Spirit will show God's real truth if you make him close. Amen. The Holy Spirit, fourthly, job is to magnify Christ. Folks, who lives in you? Back in the day when we were on missions, we, we used to go and we'd go out into the field. And these people have been shared. Jesus was shared with them. But you know how people forget. We talked about that. So we'd go out in the mission field and we'd ask them, where does God live? And many of them would point up. Right? But that's how we knew they didn't know God. Because God was still distant. But the ones that knew him would point to the inside themselves and go, in my heart. God lives in my heart. Okay, so let's take what we've learned tonight, make a mark here. We're going to come back at the promise of being empowered. And then we're going to show you all about it. <clears throat> Even hearing God's voice. Okay. So let's think about this. Who lives in us? And who's working together for your good? Okay. So you get up in the morning. What's your first thought? Honestly. What's your first thought? Well, it's another day. Some people, hi, God. Some, you know, it's different things, isn't it? And you know, after a while, you want it to be focused on God. So in order that happen, you have to get used to addressing God throughout, throughout the day. Just get used to talking to him like he's there right there buddying up with you. Just talk with him. Lord, gosh sakes, man, I got to drive these big nails down through this tent. And man, I tell you what, there's some big rocks in there. Can you wiggle on down there and move them aside? So here I'm exchanging words with God, and your head's going... Hey, how come you're not including me, the head? Your head's very jealous when your heart talks with God. Your head will tell you all kinds of things like, how come you're just nuts? How come you're just carrying a conversation with God? Why are you leaving me out? And pretty soon, you begin to hear, because God's working with you, the three parts of your being talking. Now, is there anybody present tonight that's heard all three or at one time or another different portions? Of, we know we are a three-part being. We're spirit. We have a soul and we live in a body. Have you ever heard your spirit speak? It's your conscience. Hello? That's a real part deep down inside where it says call I'm going to use you, Jackie. Call Jackie. <laughs> call Jackie. And Jackie's thinking, man, they're supposed to call me. I wonder what, what's going on. See, that's your spirit. It's far smarter. Now listen to because I'm kind of wrapping it up. It's far smarter than your head because it has who in it? Come on, get with me. Don't be thinking about what you're going to eat when you leave here. You have God inside of you. Okay? God is smart. He's yeah. no dummy. But you've got to get used to hearing him. So in your spirit, it's far smarter than your head. So the world says, you got psychic energy. You have psychic powers. There's no such thing as psychic powers. It's spiritual. Your spirit has powers in it. Now that you're born again, you got God in there, so you know you have power in there. 
But before, your spirit has power in it because you are made in God's image after God's likeness. So Satan shuts you off right away when you were a kid. He got you all boobered up since you were a teenager, all wrapped up in everything so that what's inside can't break loose and find God. Okay? So you're very powerful in your spirit, but your head is supposed to serve your spirit. Your head's a computer, right? Yeah. It's time for some of you to change the app. <laughs> Hello. You got an old app in there. It's, it's causing crashes. I'm just funning with you. So your spirit is alert, it's alive, it never sleeps. It's your spirit that brings you things and knowing because the Holy Spirit's in there. Your head's supposed to serve your spirit. So don't let your head wander away. What do you mean? Don't let your head drift around and start thinking things that are negative. Don't let your head dwell on things of your past. And certainly don't dwell on what I call the three no-nos, world, people, and yourself, because it's supposed to serve you, and you're supposed to stuff your head with knowledge, biblical knowledge, can you say amen? It's just a computer. Garbage goes in, and when you need something, garbage comes out. <laughs> Junk goes in, junk comes out. Feed yourself with good things. Tell yourself, I am a good person. God thinks I am. God knows that I am. Don't let your mind play old recordings. It does. Old recordings. And then your body. How many know <coughs> this hangs around? I take it everywhere I go. Wherever I go, there it is. Hello. Amen. Who's that you brought with you, Carrie? Oh, that's my flesh. It seems to follow me everywhere. So remember, your flesh is also made to serve your spirit. It's made to be your slave. In other words, when you sit down to eat, your flesh, your hand... Your fork goes to the mouth. Hello? It's supposed to serve you. We know if there's a motor problem, your mind can't get your body to do things, then we know that's a, a, a muscle dystrophy. My mom had Lou Gehrig's. She had a bright, brilliant mind, but she couldn't get the, the motor to run any of her hands or anything, and eventually... She couldn't talk and eventually couldn't breathe and her heart would stop. See, that's an awful disease. But thank God she's in heaven. Hi, Mom! You know, wonderful, wonderful lady. So we want to make sure our body serves our spirit. Make sure your mind doesn't wander away. It serves your spirit. And make sure you present yourself to God so we can help keep all that lined up. If you got something out of that tonight, give the Lord... A praise. We're going to go more.